Good morning. See some familiar faces back there. Everybody's smiling. <laughs> All right. Well, I think they have another press conference starting in a few minutes, so we'll we'll go as long as we need to. Y'all, thank you very much for coming. Of course, you know our new Lieutenant Governor, Pamela Everett. And uh, we're happy to be here with you to discuss the upcoming legislative session and the budget. As you know, the governor submits a budget. The budget this year is 478 pages long. I'm not going to cover everything that is in the 478 page budget. What I am going to cover is the things that I believe are priorities that we need to do, particularly with the one billion, almost a billion dollars in money that is anticipated to come in through taxes and, other, and fees and other sources to add to the money that we have available at the state to spend on things. So this addresses that. Now, as you know, about half of that is recurring money, a half of it is non-recurring, that is one-time money. So the items that I have, that I'll be explaining to you are those that will be addressing this new almost billion dollars that we have coming, coming in. And by the way, the fact that we have that much money coming in that was not, not anticipated is a good sign of the great economic strength of our state. We'd like to have that happen every year, to have a, mi a million more, billion more coming in than we thought. But if we keep working hard, maybe we can do that. And that is our goal, as you know, from Inauguration Day. The goal of this administration is to succeed in this economic com competition that is worldwide, that affects everything we do. Every man, woman, and child in South Carolina is affected by the economic climate and the prosperity or lack of it that we have in South Carolina. And we're in a fierce competition. And we're winning. There are some areas where we're behind, there are others where we're ahead. But we want to be ahead in all of them. And that, will, that means we have, to, we have to be serious about what we're doing. As you know, we've, we've announced over eight billion, since, since I've been in this office, we've announced over $8 billion in new capital investment, 27,000 new jobs. That is a record. We've been going up over the years, more and more every year. But that is the greatest uh, increase that we've had uh, ever. Uh, are we one of the top exporters of tires, completed automobiles, our manufacturing employment growth is 16%. It's the highest in the southeast. We recognized over and over in various periodicals and experts as one of the best places in, in the country to do business, and we aim to keep growing. So we're in a serious competition, and to win this competition, there are a number of things that we must do. Last year, I proposed a $2.2 billion tax cut. That was last year in my executive budget. I'm not proposing that in this executive budget. I intend to propose it, hope to propose it in other executive budgets, but the reason that we are not proposing that now is because the, the General Assembly, its leaders are anticipating a general, a, a thorough study analysis and tax reform measure that will be presented, we hope, this year. So we're working with them. We've already met with leaders of the House on that, and we expect to have a comprehensive plan. And by the way, some of you may remember uh, an economics expert by the name of Dr. Arthur Laffer. He is a, he's agreed to come and uh, analyze our tax situation here to see that we can't be made the best in the nation. He's done that in other places, as has a, have other people who have gone and have assisted the states in developing a plan that allows for the strongest economic competition and prosperity. So we look forward very much to working with the leaders on that comprehensive tax, comprehensive tax overhaul. I've asked the legislature in this executive budget to do something we've never done before. That is, as I mentioned, we have almost a billion dollars coming in that we did not expect. I've asked the legislature in my bud budget to rebate or give back to the taxpayers $200 million of that billion dollars. That's $200 million back to the taxpayer. We keep telling the taxpayers that our job in the state government is to find ways to save money, to spend money wisely, and whenever we can, to return their tax money to them. If we can't cut the taxes, we certainly need to rebate as much money as we can. Well, this year, as you know, we have almost a billion dollars that we did not expect 
to have. This is more than we expected. So this is the right year to make good on that promise and to return that tax money to the citizens who paid it in. And that will come to $200 million of that approximate billion. Now, now let's turn to education. As you know, the economic prosperity and development is the core of our prosperity. And education is the core of our economic growth and prosperity. So we must have dramatic education reform in South Carolina. Now is the time. We've all seen the numbers. We all know the figures. We all know the situation. I and others have been to the school districts. We, we know what we must do. And we know that from the investors and the companies and the visitors who come to South Carolina that want to invest in South Carolina. But a, a question may arise, it has arisen in the, in the past, certain to arise in the future, is the education quality in South Carolina. From K-12 on through technical college, the two year, four years, and beyond. So we must be have, we must have the highest quality education system from top to bottom in South Carolina that we can manage. And in order to do that, one of the things that we must do in order to be competitive is we must, be, must have and must be known as having the very finest teachers and educators in the United States. We are not there yet. We do have some of the finest, but we need to be known as having the finest. And as I've said, if we are known for being weak in an area in our state for economic growth and prosperity, if we are known for being weak in education, that's not good. But if, if we are known for not fixing it, for not understanding it and not fixing it, that is disastrous. I intend to fix it. I intend to work vigorously with the leadership of the General Assembly. We have already begun and we're going to fix education in South Carolina. There's no reason why a state like this, with the talent we have, with the resources we have, not to have the very finest education system in the United States. So that's what we're going to do. And here's how we're going to do it. One will be a pay raise for the teachers of South Carolina, 5%. That's $155 million of those new dollars. That increase, that 5% increase, will bring our average teacher salary to $53,185, which is $355 above the now projected southeastern average salary for 2020, which is $52,830. Again, we will be the average teacher salary to 53,185, which is above the Southeast average of 52,830. That's step one. What are we gonna do about the rural areas? We have some, that, remember, poverty is the enemy of education. There's some places that businesses won't go. There's some places where the young people growing up leave. And one common connector is always poverty. It's a lack of economic activity, a lack of economic vigor. So how do, we, how do we take economic growth and opportunity to those rural districts, not necessarily counties? A county may be very wealthy on one end and poor on the other. So what I propose is a plan that will determine which of our school districts are riddled with poverty in all, and lacking in education resources so that we can address that. And part of that is for the struggling school districts to have a state-backed, not county-backed, but a state-backed economic development commitment to bring jobs to those communities by providing infrastructure, not only in water, sewer, and roads, but in school buildings and facilities. Here's how it works. If a company is interested in investing in South Carolina and they are, they are interested in a, a certain part of the state, we will suggest this area here would love to have you there. There's no water, there's no sewer. We will provide that. The buildings need repair, we will repair those buildings. We may build new buildings. They don't have the bonding capacity themselves to do it. So the state will do that. Education is a statewide problem. It is a statewide opportunity. It is a statewide responsibility. And as I mentioned in, at the inauguration, 
a weak system in one part of our state affects the whole state. So we must be hitting on all cylinders and we, the, the poorest, our, our rural, which always typically in the rural areas, those poor districts need help. This will provide the spark. This fund will provide that for them. It will be called a Rural School District Economic Development Closing Fund. I propose we put $100 million in it for the Department of Commerce to invest in bringing new jobs and investment to our state's poorest school districts. Ladies and gentlemen, the words corridor of shame will soon be a fading memory in South Carolina. This is our year to do what we want to do and what we need to do and what our state must do in education to maintain, enhance, and accelerate our economic progress and growth. The budget again prioritized my budget, school safety, by providing $46 million in recurring funds to place a trained certified law enforcement officer, a school resource officer, in schools that cannot afford them. Some schools can't afford them. Some schools already have them. Sometimes have, some schools have resource officers part-time. We will have $46 million available in recurring funds to keep a certified, trained law enforcement officer in every school in every district in South Carolina. Every school and every teacher will now have access also to a trained mental health counselor trained mental health counselor from a recurring appropriation of $2.2 million to the Department of Mental Health for those services. Uh, today we have mental health counselors that, that travel from place to place. There are not enough of them, but we want every school, when they need one, to have one. They don't need to have an office in the school because they don't need to be there 100% of the time. But when, they, when we need them, when we know we're going to need them, we need to have them available, and that's precisely what this $46 million will enable. For decades, every family's goal was for children to go to college, which of course meant a four-year college degree. I refer typically, uh, particularly to after World War II, that was, that was everyone's goal, and you had the GI Bill and other things to where generations went to college. Well, that still is. Higher education still is the key to the future. Brain power is essential. If you read the magazines and periodicals about what's going on in other countries, you see they are focusing on brain power, intellectual capacity, innovation, and education because they realize that is the key to great economic prosperity. Well, so do we. We still have people coming from all countries all over the world to the United States because of our, our, our educational prowess. But ladies and gentlemen, the, the world has changed, and today we have manufacturers, plant, we have high-tech technologies that are combining to, com to form a completely new workplace, and a four-year degree typically is not necessary. Economic prosperity can be achieved today through associate two-year degrees and a multitude of certificates from our state's technical colleges. The very excellent news is that our state technical college system created in 1961 has 16 units now, and it is recognized as the finest workforce development system in the United States. We need to understand that and take advantage of it, but that means we have to expand it. A skilled and educated workforce ensures economic prosperity for all South Carolinians, However, the cost and debt associated with higher education is becoming a financial barrier for too many potential students and their families. My executive budget takes the first step towards reining in these rising costs by proposing a freeze on tuition and fees for in-state students in our state's technical schools, colleges, and universities for the 2019-2020 academic year. In exchange for that freeze of in-state tuition fees, an, an institution, which will be certified by the Commission on Higher Education, an institution will receive a 6% increase to their annual base budget, which represents their pro rata share of a $36 million appropriation. That is, to the schools, if you freeze your tuition for the next academic year, you will receive a portion of that money, general fund money, to go to your regular budget. 
I've added additional $63 million to enhance existing workforce, workforce partnerships, training, grants, and scholarships available for the students at our technical colleges. That's $63 million. Again, the tech, our technical college system is at the heart. It plays a critical role in the economic growth and prosperity of this, this state. These additional funds will allow our technical colleges to develop partnerships with local businesses and high schools for internships and certificates in the skilled technical trades. My budget triples, that budget, that 63 million, triples funding with $19 million for our technical college system, successful, nationally recognized, Ready South Carolina program, Ready SC. They talk about it around the world, where we will have our people from the technical college system go to look at a plant in another country and come back and set up a curricula built for that company. Nobody else in the United States does that. Well, we're going to supercharge that with 19 more million out of, out of that 63 million. And again, that is, that is the key to that education. That is a critical part of our educational approach. We must be bold, as I've mentioned to the leaders of the legislature, of General Assembly, we in conferences and discussions uh, for some time now. We have to be bold, alert, and think long term, and that, of course, includes and takes us to public safety. Public safety. You can't have any of what I've been discussing without public safety. If we don't, if we have to fear for ourselves, our children, our property every time we leave the house and we, we, we have major problems. My budget takes action to lower the tax burden on retired military veterans and first responders. I asked for this last year. We didn't get it. We need to get it this year. It's a part of our economic prosperity and growth. That includes retired state and federal law enforcement officers, firefighters, and peace officers. How we're going to do it is through a full retirement income exemption. If you're the military, law enforcement, and you're retired receiving income, that retirement income is exempt from income tax in South Carolina. What will this do? This will aid dramatically in the retention of experienced, qualified police officers, firefighters, and others to stay in our state and work and add their strength to our prosperity. I've also included an additional $33.6 million for law enforcement for raises. Raises. This will result in retention for corrections officers, law enforcement, probation, firefighting, and other criminal justice agencies to use for those pay raises. That turns us to prisons. In order to expedite security system upgrades as well as critical repairs to damage prison facilities, I'm seeking an additional $40 million that will be provided to the Department of Corrections to keep both inmates and the corrections officers safe. And as you know, our, our state again, with Director Sterling is leading the country in innovative programs to take prisoners who have served their time, have paid the price, and on the way out to get them ready for the workplace. That is a great program, and again, it's all aimed towards the economic prosperity of our people. Ethics. Maintaining the public's trust in government at all levels requires transparency and accountability and why and how every single tax dollar is spent. I believe that the best, best disinfectant against waste and corruption or suspicions of waste and corruption is sunshine. That is, open the door, let the sunshine in. Anyone, that is anyone who is paid to influence decisions by elected officials or appointed officials, state, county, municipal, school board, or anyone else, if they are paid to, to influence the decision of these officials, then they must register as a lobbyist. That is not the law now. The law only requires those who lobby the members of the General Assembly, the agencies, the executive. It only requires them to register as lobbyists and pay. But as you may know, there's, a, there's much lobbying that goes on in these other entities, in the city halls, in the county councils, at the school boards, all over the place. Well, if they are lobbying, if they're paid by someone else, then they need to register as a lobby and they need to pay the fee for that. And the fee for that, we, we 
calculate will come to about $185,000 a year, and that will be used to enhance the investigative power of our Ethics Commission. Finally, as I stated last week, those of us in this building and around the state that are involved in, in government are all on the same team. Sometimes we don't speak the same language, and sometimes we certainly don't wear the same jerseys. But we're all on the same team. We all play under the banner of the state of South Carolina. It is a very proud banner, and it is one that we are dedicated to seeing is never soiled, but is risen, we rise high to take our people, give them the opportunity to go as far as their ambition, talents, will take them. That means we must turn the page, we must have a new day on education in South Carolina. We must remember that we are in an economic competition. We must remember that we must keep the people safe. And if we do that, if we do those things, and all it takes to do that, we have the spirit, all it takes is passing a few laws, changing a few systems, which only requires signing papers and voting. It's not heavy lifting, it's debate, and it's making a determination that we're gonna go forward. And if we do those things, South Carolina's future is bright, bright, and our, I hope our, our children will, will stay here. There are a lot of them that go to other places. We want them to understand South Carolina is the best place to be, and this is where they ought to be. And as an aside, a lot of my friends go on vacations to all sorts of places. They go to Aruba, they go to Antigua. And I say, have you been to Pauly's Island? Have you, <laughs> have you been to Caesar's Head? Have you been to those places? They are certainly as spectacular as anyone. We've got it all in South Carolina, and we need to proud of it, be proud of it, and we need to be sure we make it even better for future generations. Governor, words? Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you all for coming this morning. Um, not only as your lieutenant governor, but as a mom. I'm very excited about a lot of the things that the governor presented this morning. And I'm looking forward to rolling up my sleeves, um, working with the House and Senate to make sure we get a lot of these agenda items passed, because this, this is going to be good for the people of South Carolina. So again, thank you very much for showing up this morning. Any questions? Yes, sir. It's the things that, that, that have been on the subjects that I mentioned, the points I mentioned, and it, it appears that everyone is, is in agreement. There may be a little difference in tone, because uh, sometimes we do speak. This is in different, different parties as well, in different parts of the state. But I, I think the consensus from those that, that I've had conversations with in, over, over the months is now, now is the time, that, that this year is, is the right year. And the, the fact that we have this surplus that we was not expected coming in is, is, is like a, a gift from, from the sky that makes it more imperative that we do it this year. But I think we've, I think we've built a great team. Now, there may be some that have a few uh, differences on the details, but the general thrust is everyone I've talked to understands that this is, this is our year to take <coughs> education in South Carolina to the top. Yes, sir. As you know, Governor Haley uh, appointed uh, Tra former Attorney General Travis Medlock and me to head the Ethics Reform Commission in 2012. We issued a report. We had a, a great group, uh, uh, again, uh, that uh, I, I say again, the talent in this state is, is unbelievable, and we have plenty of it. And if you were to digress for a moment, if you look at our uh, flood water a flooding commission, if you look at the talent on that, I, I think you, you'll agree uh, wholeheartedly. So we had uh, great talent and insight on that commission. We met for months, issued a report. Some of those things have been adopted, others uh, have not been. But uh, one, of the, one of the recommendations we made was to have everyone that influences for money, that is, is working for someone else, working for principal, to influence any sort of a public official 
uh, needs to register as a lobbyist. But this ethics reform has been something that, that uh, many of us in public life have been very uh, uh, been emphasizing for many years. I am one of those. More questions? It's a, it's a level, it's an index of the dis, dis, district based on poverty. Well, that's as far as we went. That might be where the money runs out. We, we, <laughs> what we're going to do is start, it, it, is start where it is needed the most and work our way up. And if, if the program works as well as we believe it will, then this, this will be a great thing to expand upon in the future. Part of this is recognizing that education in one county is as important to the people in that county as it is as it is to the people in this county. We're all one part of the of the whole. As John Dunn said in 1720, 1624, is that when it was? No man is an island. Each is a part of the main part of the mainland. Sin, no, sin, uh, every man's life affects me. Sin not to know know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Uh, thought you'd be interested in it. I've read a book. <laughs> but that, that's the way we need to see it, and there are a lot of other things we need to see that way because we've got a great team. If you, if you had to throw a net around or draw a circle around uh, any place in the country where you're looking for talent, resources, a magnificent environment, this would be the place. So I think we need to start acting like that. And that, that means if someone has a problem there and we can, we can fix it over here, then we collaborate and fix it. These new words, collaborate, communicate, and cooperate. Usually in government, you have silo, 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 and you have people even in different agencies working at odds. We're eliminating all those silos, and our, our hallmarks could be communicate, collaborate, and cooperate. This is a better way. The, the best way to see it is to see it from, from the top. If you've ever looked at a maze, and you're in the maze, and you're trying to find your way around, you can't do it. But if you go up above, and you're able to look down at the whole picture, you can see it's very easy where you take the turns and where the dead ends are. Likewise, the Department of Commerce in their contacts with people around the world, business leaders, people who want to invest money, people in the state who want to move or looking for another location, site locators that come. They don't go to the districts. They don't go to the counties. There is some county participation, of course, because the counties have the economic groups as well, but they always come to the Department of Commerce. So that is the right place from which to begin making those kind of decisions. Of course, it will have to be with input from the various districts. Well, that's, that was not the goal, but that will be a, a, a byproduct of that, is it will be carefully monitored uh, by the state through the, Depart through the uh, Department of Commerce. The information, how the money is used, what, uh, and what's being done will be very easy uh, to, to uh, access uh, for anyone in this building or other places who want to have it, because it will be in one place. How can you put a time frame on change? Can you put it you in? can't. The if time frame is... No, we're going we're gonna to do this this year. The only time we have is now. That's all. Well, no, this is recurring. This is recurring money. Mr. Kenny? Probably not. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Do you have a message for the lotto winner from your state that maybe millions are waiting for the 60 million tax revenue from that? Do you have a message for that person? I'd say whoever that person is is mighty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last question. How might y'all go around the state and uh, I'm glad you asked that question. That is what we're going to do. We have, a, we have a new player on the field. Our lieutenant governor is committed to this. And she and I will be promoting this in every way that we can. And that is typically by explaining it to groups, to 
to leaders, to interested citizens around the state. So you can expect to see us and others. And I, I, some of some of the legislative leaders are already talking about this. I mean, this is this is uh, again is a big team. But we, the two of us, intend to be sure that everyone in the state is aware of what, what of this effort, and that they know why it is important for them to get behind it and support it. Again, our future is so bright. It's so bright, and we we have to change a few laws. That's all we need to do. Just change a few laws, make some decisions, and there's no stopping the people of this state. They're great people. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.